Hi everyone, Dan Gunner from Insane Cyber. Welcome back to Tech Talk Tuesday, where every week we try to give something to help your threat hunting and security program. And today we're going to continue our series on Volt Typhoon, and we're going to jump into finding malicious masquerading RDP sessions. So this is another part of the Volt Typhoon attack that happened that can be tricky to find. So we'll cover both host and network da data sources to look into and how to correlate between both of them. So in case you missed previous ones on Volt Typhoon, Volt Typhoon advisory released back in February. Um, basically, U.S. put out an interagency report that said, hey, with high confidence, we believe that Chinese actors or actors of with Chinese intent are pre-positioning themselves on IT and OT network um, for future potential disruptive operations should things heat up. Uh, there was actually a report a few months even before late 2023 where um, a report came out covering living on the land style of techniques. Um, this report kind of extended that and said, hey, we both have kind of evidence that these groups have lived on networks for five plus years and that they're using different tactics like compromising firewalls, which we talked about last week, as well as some others. So. This week, we're going to slide, dive into a different part of this. So in the past, we've covered password cracking. We've talked about the vulnerabilities last week. Um, obtaining admin cre credentials, we actually did a past Tech Talk Tuesday, and this covers into the number six, extract in ntds.dit in the system registry hive. There's actually a Tech Talk Tuesday we did on those before. Um, that, though, is a way you can get that file. That's the database that Active Directory actually stores the account information in, bring it back, use John the Ripper, use other tools to actually go through that. Um, but today, there's kind of three parts of the Volt Typhoon portion we haven't gone through. So today, we're going to cover that RDP with valid credentials because you may or may not detect another part of Volt Typhoon. By the way, this diagram actually comes from the CISA interagency report that we mentioned. Um, you might detect some of these other things, but it's important to be like, okay, how would I detect each on their own? Um, because that might be the event that actually gets you to figuring out that you have a problem um, that may be Volt Typhoon. So um, we won't cover recon. We won't cover strategic network pre-positioning this week probably in a future one this week, we're going to cover RDP with valid credentials. And so this aligns with actually two MITRE techniques. So there's T1078, um, which is the use of valid accounts. These accounts, right, with RDP, it could be three types of accounts. These could be default accounts. So for industrial systems, there are maintenance accounts that are often put on to a given box, right? So if an attacker in the plant is using a default account or one of the service accounts, that could be one that's used. That may or may not be a domain or local account, right? So you know, whether it be a default account that's kind of on the system by default or whether it be a domain or local user account, you know, it's going to fall into some iteration of T1078 valid accounts. It's also going to fall into T1021001. This is the use of the remote desktop protocol which, by the way, um, the group that's behind Volt Typhoon, there are also a lot of other groups that like to use this. They're not alone on this. Everyone from APT3941 to Lazarus to Oil Rig. So a lot of different groups that are aligned with the different interests of different countries. Um, so again, this is actually a good one to kind of talk through and know about. So when we jump into how do we find this on network data, one of the ways we can start is with Zeek. One of the ways to do this, especially with the newer RDP variants, is they use SSL. Um, if you look at Zeke's documentation, they actually have some solid examples. So the screenshots we pulled out are actually from Zeke's um, documentation. But with the newer RDP variants, um, there's certain information that can point you to RDP. Um, Newer RDP does use SSH in a lot of places. This makes it challenging to maybe see some of the other information on what's going on. But again, the SSL log is one place you might find it. One way of doing it is if RDP is on 3389, the standard port, um, you can look at cert information, right? If you look here on the left, you see the subject and issuer generally ends up being the host name of the Windows box. It's tied to port 3389. 
um, the subject and issuer and both, like we said, um, line up there. You can line up actually the SSL log with the X509 log. So the X509 log is actually the certificate. If you see in that X509, the bottom left, you have the ID, that ID in the top left for the SSL log is in that search chain foods. And so when you talk about correlating these logs manually, um, this is what it looks like. So you actually will need both SSL log and the X509 log to get both, um, or you can see subject and issuer often is in both. Um, but yeah, this is one way to do it, is to look for port 3389 with cert information. RDP doesn't have to run on 3389. There are some vendors that do run it, sometimes on other weird ports. Um, so if you don't know what port it runs on, this might not be as helpful, but if it's on 3389, there is contextual information we can use to be like, okay, um, again, this is probably RDP. Should this be happening between these two boxes, right? Another one, the con log, the connection log for Zeek. Another one, you can also look for port 3389. Your proto might be TCP and service might be SSL. Um, for RDP, it's important to know, sometimes it can run on UDP, right? So don't just look for TCP 3389, also look for UDP. Um, there are tells you can do also on this. So the length of connection, amount of things transferred, um, other data can kind of help you find this. Again, you're going to need to know roughly what port it's going to cross on. Um, so again, you're kind of restricted because again, you don't have deeper context on this. But as we move to the next one, we actually will have deeper context. So RDP, when it's initiating the session, actually uses something called a RDP cookie or it sends it. Um, the cookie is often the username. <coughs> it goes across on the wire. Sometimes it's truncated if you have longer usernames. Um, Josh Liberti actually did a really good bro 2015 talk on this called Hunting Through RDP Data. The talks on YouTube, the slides are out there. Um, but Zeek does have an RDP log. This isn't on by default. It might depend on your version of Zeek on if it's there. But the advantage here is you again have the source and destination um, max and um, ports. So again, you're getting over this. and that cookie in there is often the username. And even with it being encrypted, you see result encrypted there. Um, we're still able to see, hey, the test user was the one that did this. So definitely check, tap, check out Josh's talk, but the RDP log in Zeek is another great way to look for this type of traffic. So how do I know if the session's malicious, right? A lot of these logs only looked for the fact that the session happened. Um, figuring out is it malicious, and especially if you have a lot of RDP sessions, you know, there might be some challenge there, right? And so that's where you have to bring in that connection context, right? Um, source information on, does this source talk to this destination? When should they talk? Um, is this one that an admin or that some given account usually should RDP from? In Volt Typhoon, I think they were using admin level RDP, right? And so, looking at your admin accounts look closely, looking at those service accounts, right? We were talking service accounts earlier. Um, the context of the account, right? Because an attacker might just have the account on your network, they might not have the contextually proper account to do that, right? So you might see kind of a break in context there, especially when you bring in time of day, operational need, that type of deal. Um, looking for this type of traffic is important and when you look at the preventative side of this, trying to limit certain connections from happening, this is also where you can have some key, pretty big wins on there. User context, the scope of duties, again, what should a user admin into? What should a user connect to? That's all important. Um, you could even go a little further as you're digging into a given user and say, what did that connected user do? What were, were there any EDR alerts, other things that went on? that might point out this is malicious, right? But at that point, you're kind of starting to peel away the onion to see if this is malicious there. That's the network side. Now moving to the host side. Um, another one that we've done uh, Tech Talk Tuesday on is 4624 login events. So this is one that's in your security log by default, which is nice. So some of the other nice to have ones you won't necessarily have, but this is one that's on by default. 
Looking for your login type of TIN for remote interactive. This means the user came in via terminal services or remote desktop or 12, right? It cached remote interactive, right? This might be used for internal auditing, as it said. But the advantage here is if you have this either streaming into an instance you're looking at or if you need to go to the host, you have the username and IP information that gets pulled out. This is something we actually pull out a lot because... Um, like for this event, right? Knowing, hey, a user remotely connected with the admin account did this, it's going to be in this log. And again, type 10 for terminal services or remote desktop. And again, timeline analysis. And if you have host data, the advantage is you can go into some of the other logs. And some of these logs might not be enabled depending on what your audit settings are. Um, hopefully some of them are. If you're in certain environments like a uh, government where they have like disses stigs and other things, then um, for government systems, some of these will be there, right? For other vendors, they have, they're similar of, hey, let's turn on this type of auditing. We know asset owners too that actually use Sysmon and collect it. And so um, depending on the plant you're at, depending on you know how forward thinking some of the groups are, you might be able to get into scheduled tasks. You might be able to get into the PowerShell event logs that have the command line. You might be able to see then that ntds.did and other behaviors. Again, that's someone trying to collect the Active Directory user database to use it before, right? Um, the thing to point out with Full Typhoon is that these attackers triggered several attack technique behaviors. And so again, you know, bringing in data and being able to process it is super important um, because if they're not deleting it out, they're probably not modifying. Um, the most they do is delete the data out most likely. Um, some attackers might modify, but you get into different complexities. So again, we covered the RDP with valid credentials. Um, this was one kind of center that you see in there we hadn't covered. But again, going back to it, right? When you look at Volt Typhoon, there were a lot of different steps that they took during the attack. And so being able to capture each and learn from each different step is key. Because again, that might be this step that actually gets you to where you can either move forward or back in the progression and begin to dig up what's happening underneath. So thanks for tuning in this week. Again, we wanted to cover Volt Typhoon and the RDP portion and how to find that both in host and network logs. If you have any thoughts, please drop them in the comments below. If you have ideas for future Tech Talk Tuesdays, we'd love to hear them. And we hope to see you back next week. Thanks a lot.